continuing our exploration of the metaphysics of Aristotle, we're looking at the infinite here in part three. For Aristotle, there was a problem with thinking about the infinite. Everything has to have a proper place. So he certainly affirmed this, earth, air, fire, and water, the elements have a proper place. Nature is teleological and things go where they're supposed to go, so to speak. But an infinite body could not have a proper place. We'll think about reasons why he would affirm this in just a moment, but let's put these two premises together. We conclude that the infinite cannot exist in a body. So this is a problem. Now, for support for our second premise here, that an infinite body couldn't have a proper place, we might go back to think about Anaximander's arguments against one element being primary. And we're getting this from the book of physics here. For Anaximander, he said, look, it, it wouldn't make sense if one element, only one element existed. If one element was the apuron, how would you have room, so to speak, for anything else? If everything were water, like his predecessor Thales thought, then how do you get water from that? If everything's water, how do you get, sorry, fire from that? It just doesn't make any sense. And so if something's infinite, you can't have any differentiation. There would be no place at all if it weren't for differences. So it, having locations, having places, differentiation at all doesn't make sense if there is one thing that is infinite, it leaves no room for anything else. But then on the flip side of that, if there's not an infinite, that would mean that time will have a beginning and an end. And as we'll see uh, later in, other, in part four and part five, of our exploration of Aristotle's metaphysics, we see why that's problematic. Briefly, you could kind of think about it this way, for Aristotle's reasoning, there would be a time when there was no time, which is obviously violating the principle of non-contradiction and doesn't really make sense. So if you don't have infinite time, that's problematic for Aristotle. Also, a magnitude would not be divisible into other magnitudes. So here we're thinking about if you could divide a clump of something in half, well, certainly if you took that one half and divided it again, that would make sense, and so on and so on. There's no clear stopping point at this place. And so it goes on for infinity. This is something that Zeno was concerned about, and Aristotle's going to ultimately respond to Zeno here. And if there's no infinite at all, you couldn't have infinite numbers. But clearly, numbers are infinite. You can, there's no stopping place to counting the natural numbers. For example, you one, two, three, four, five, and there's no place to stop. So there has to be infinite that exists in some sense, even though we have good reason to think that infinite does not exist. So putting these problems together, if anything exists, it has to exist either potentially or in actuality. Those are the only two ways that anything can exist for Aristotle. But the infinite can't exist in actuality for the reasons we've already said, the arguments that we just presented. But nothing could possibly be infinite in potentiality unless it is at some time actually infinite. We can't say that some, something has a potentiality unless at some point that potentiality becomes actualized so we can't say the infinite merely exists in potentiality unless it is at some time actualized there being an actual infinite, but that can't happen like we just said. So with these problems, how do we resolve it? What does Aristotle say? So Aristotle says, 
here's how we need to think about the infinite. The infinite exists in potentiality, like the Olympics does, and just like the ancient Greek Olympics and our contemporary Olympics, these things occur and expanded over several days. So the Olympics exist, but never in their entirety, right? You can't say on this day, we're seeing the Olympics and we get all of it. Now, but you can say we're seeing the Olympics. So you, you don't have it all at once. So the infinite exists, but you just don't have it all at once. It exists in two ways for Aristotle. It exists in division, so it makes sense to think about division with infinity. Magnitudes can be divided ad infinitum through infinity, if at least only in your mind. And infinity exists in addition, like time, like the Olympics, like numbers. So when we talk about the infinite existing, it does exist, but in one of these two ways. So these concerns that Aristotle raises here in his discussion of the infinite are going to raise some questions about the nature of time. And Aristotle addresses this at various works. So he does a little bit in De Interpretatione, for example. How do you deal with claims, statements about the past and the present and the future, are those things currently true? And you have some puzzles there. And contemporary philosophers continue to struggle with the nature of time, certainly. And contemporary mathematicians, it really wasn't until the 20th century that we saw significant progress on understanding the nature of the infinite. So what Aristotle has to say about the infinite helps us make sense of Zeno's paradoxes. You can see my videos on Zeno's paradox and, and I describe how what we're talking about here with the infinite resolves the paradoxes, at least from Aristotle's perspective. And I, I think he's got a good ideas there on how that works. But so for 2000 years, or so, plus it seems that Aristotle's insights to the infinite were very significant, as with most of his other works and ideas. It cast a shadow over the next several, several centuries of philosophy, and that's certainly the case with the infinite. In part four, we're going to talk about self-movers and the unmoved mover.